All right. Well, good morning, everybody, or whatever time it is when you watch this, if you're watching the recording. Uh, my name is Taryn Almondars. I am a developer advocate for Pantheon. And welcome to my talk, DevOps for front-end developers who can't back-end good and want to learn to understand other stuff good, too. This talk is a very large Zoolander reference. So, we're going to start out with this, this woman looking wistfully out the window. Have you ever wondered if there was more to life other than being really, really ridiculously good at making good-looking front ends? That's a Zoolander reference. There is. It's DevOps with front end development. So I am Taryn Almendarez, a developer advocate at Pantheon. Um, I am Nine Lives Black Cat on Drupal.org. On Twitter, I am at Taryn G, because my last name used to be Glover and not Almendarez, less letters. I live in Dallas, Texas, and things that I enjoy when I'm not doing front end development or helping people with their code is studying Japanese, baking, cycling, and spin classes. I like this slide because Pantheon encourages us to have the human side of ourselves on display, so. Konnichiwa. Um, oh, konnichiwa. Is that right? Hi. Full this, y'all. That's probably all I'll get. <laughs> no, you're good. All right, y'all, so if you're in this talk, you probably have an idea of what DevOps is, but in case you don't, DevOps is short for Development Operations. Uh, it's a collaborative, shared approach to tasks that people in development and IT ops team do. Um, it, uh, is a form of iterative software development, so you're not just building the app on your own in a silo and just launching it out to the world. Uh, there's infrastructure deployment, maintenance, all of the stuff that comes after the most fun part, front-end development. So, as a front-end developer, I feel, uh, I guess I'm realizing that I'm rambling and not talking about why this talk was important to me to give. Um, when I first started professionally in development. I worked for the city of Dallas and we had like a smaller operation. We were hosting our site ourselves. Uh, we didn't really have version control. My senior developer would make copies of the files and then that was our backup. When I left the city of Dallas after three years doing like really great work serving people, um, I moved to an Azure DevOps shop in finance and it was just completely different. I was doing React development. Um, I had to learn how to deploy to like these different environments. I found out that hard coding things was not encouraged in those types because there were so many different places for things to go. Um, and I just wanted to do this talk so that other people that might have been working on small sites by themselves or with a really small team that didn't have a complicated infrastructure that y'all would be able to not have as many of the crying fits that I went through in frustration, so. The bonus is that you can become an Ambi developer, not to be confused with full stack. This is yet another Zoolander reference. Because he can't turn left. There's an Easter egg related to this in the slides. I don't know if anybody's gonna catch it. So, um, this is a DevOps service diagram. It's actually by hostersSI.com. I know that it's Pantheon colors, and I was like, well, I'm not the person that does graphics anymore all by myself, so I'm just going to borrow this and say thank you to hosters.si. Um, this is a diagram of what DevOps looks like. On the left-hand side, for me, when I was in my journey, I would just build things and code them. We would plan them first. Mostly you would plan your project first, and then you do some testing, right? Um, on the right hand side in the dark black color you've got release, deploy, operate, and monitor before you go back to planning. Um, this is a loop uh, that, uh, oh, sorry, nurse. Um, this loop describes like the, if you're just making like a website, right? Like a product website for something for like your local club uh, where you guys are playing chess or checkers, you can just launch your site and it's cool. But if you're doing something like a progressive web application, if you're building like tools that are connecting into APIs, you've got to make sure that you're doing your releases and deployments and operating and monitoring. I'm realizing that I'm talking about this part. Um, DevOps is not always a strategy that folks should use. Like I said, if you're doing a small personal site, 
it might be overkill to go into this, but if you have a team that's more than a few people, um, you should definitely be using a, some DevOps infrastructure. Um, when you're not a one man or one person band, you know, um, when you are not a one person band, if both of y'all are trying to go to the same place, just like in traffic, you might collide. You might delete each other's code. You might change the button that says view my statement to print my statement. And then another person's gonna get a bunch of phone calls asking why the print button doesn't work. This happened once. Um, if you have projects with sophisticated relationships, like all of our Drupal sites are, you've got um, the files, I just, this is not in the slides, but I just thought of uh, Zoolander and Hansel going, the files are in the computer. But um, when you have databases that you're connecting to, you've got all these different content types, uh, and especially in Drupal, you've got your configurations that you've got to move from one instance to another. Um, that's important for using the DevOps infrastructure. Um, because you need to maintain those relationships throughout the different environments that you'll have. We're gonna talk in a bit about dev, test, and live, and why those are important uh, in order to communicate with your teams. Um, if you've got a site that makes multiple calls to APIs, like especially if there are multiple APIs that you are using, you're gonna to want to make sure that your file structure supports um, being able to send traffic to each one and get the responses back well, and that's going to impact your front end code, um, as well as sites with a lot of regular traffic or that have traffic spikes. And I mentioned this in particular from like some experiences that I have and like now things that I'm seeing as we're at Pantheon, right? Um, we had times uh, where we would have customers log in en masse because they were alerted that the pension statements were available. And so there were a couple times, well, I'll get into that, but you, you wanna make sure that you can handle if there's a traffic spike or if you've got like a bunch of people that just come to your site all at once. Uh, DevOps infrastructures can uh, keep, sorry, I am very nervous. Um, oh. <laughs> Fine. Thanks. Um, so your DevOps infrastructures can support doing a lot of traffic. So like I was saying, I, I feel weird about talking about my time at the city of Dallas, but like that was my first like serious job, right? And you know, the city of Dallas is 1.8 million people. For context, my hometown has 8,000 people. So developing a web application for something that big was a lot. Um, and well, I'll just go to the next slide because I'm realizing I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, if you decide that you don't want to de adopt DevOps principles, that's cool, it happens sometimes, right? But what, what if you decide that your big city website is not going to use DevOps? Well, it'll, uh, I, so telling a personal story here. So we had um, an email that we sent out. And usually we send them in batches. You would send them to the active employees, which were 7,000 people, and you would send them to the retirees. So put a 30 minute space between them. When we decided that that's not what we were gonna do, and all 14,000 people decided to sign in to our server that was in the closet, this happened. So, for folks that can't see this, <laughs> I have been getting this tweeted at me over and over again. Um, your traffic that comes to your site is gonna crush everything. The server's gonna be like, I don't understand. Why are all these people trying to come here? And it will serve a blank page if you're lucky. Um, it can hurt your credibility for your organization. So uh, as front-end developers, yes, we do the side that like does the UIs, but nobody's gonna be able to see your UI if you don't have the proper support underneath that. Also, my husband kept asking me, why do people keep asking you about Drupal for ants? People keep tweeting this thing. So we had to watch Zoolander <laughs> so I could explain it to them. All right, so without further ado, let's get into CI CD, which is continuous integration and continuous delivery or deployment, depending on how you like to say it. Um, there are four different stages of development under CI CD. You've got your source stage, your build stage, your test stage, and deployment stage. If you're doing development like a UX UI developer, usually 
you're under the source part. Sometimes it can be that you're just shipping it to the next people under building, but the build, test, and deployment stages are all going to impact how you set up your files. Um, each stage has to be completed before the next one fires up. Sometimes that's not necessarily the case if you're doing things on the small, sorry, if you're doing things at a small scale, you might be able to get away with like doing some testing and sourcing at the same time, right? Um, but by doing this workflow, it allows you to check for any errors, discrepancies, or any kind of deviations from the team or the project's conventions. Um, you'll also be able to know where the error occurred if you're following this workflow. Um, I know that I have been places where people are like, well, why do we have to have dev and test and live? Why can't we just push things to live? Again, Drupal for ants, things will crash. Uh, just want to make sure that you test. So, and by doing this, you'll be able to better respond to changes that will occur on your site. I know for me, when I got into this workflow, I felt more confident about the work that I was producing and when I was presenting it to people because I, if something happened, I was able to communicate, well, I think that it happened here. I understand that the test failed and this is what it says instead of like feeling like you're caught out. So with your source, um, this is talking about like where you can send your code out. Uh, there are different source tools that exist. Uh, SVN was on here and I have not used that since like a college project, which was many, many moons ago, so I took it out. Um, you've got GitLab and GitHub, which are different. <laughs> um, and then you might have a Git repo that exists on the service that you're using. So Pantheon does that. Uh, it's just like a Git repo that's there. It's not as visible, but there are ways to interact with that. And I put some other examples of things that people might be familiar with. Azure repos, um, AWS code commit. Um, this allows you to collaborate with your teammates in a fashion that makes it clear who did what. Um, if you are using an IDE, there are some plugins. Um, IDE, what does IDE stand for? Integrated Development Environment, I think. Yes, Integrated Development Environment. Thank you so much, because like, it's, you, you get used to the jargon and the lingo so much, and it's like, wait, what does that stand for and why do I use it? That was a lot of putting this talk together. Um, you can have an IDE that uh, so, for instance, I use uh, VS Code, and there's Git Lens, and Git Lens will tell you like line by line who did this line of code. Uh, I think there's Git Blame in it too, right? So I was like, who did this? Whose fault is this? But not always yeah. his fault. Well, PHP Storm, there is a feature called Annotate. Oh. Is the Git Blame, so it shows you who wrote that line. All right. So for the recording, there's in PHP Storm, it's called Annotate. Yeah, so you can use anything. Left click and it's going to show up on the menu. Oh, yeah, so awesome. No, no, you're fine. Like, this is important um, because I just use VS Code, but yeah. I know a lot of people, especially in the Drupal community, use PHP Storm. Thanks for that. I appreciate you. Um, but that is helpful for if you need to ask somebody, well, hey, I see that this is set up this way. Can you explain it to me? And it also helps if you're like, well, who is the person that did this? Maybe they were gone three years ago. So sometimes when I saw that, I felt more comfortable about changing the code. Uh, so for our build stage, we're looking at things like Docker containers, uh, software builds. And that's kind of like what I had for this one. I didn't feel like as much of that. Mm. So sometimes, going back to this build stage one, um, It'll be important as a front-end developer to know like why a build is failing, right? If there's something that you set up incorrectly, um, if it's that your Docker container like just won't fire up and you just need to restart it, right? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about all the times that I used it and I was like, why is my program not working? Because Docker crashed. But being able to understand and reset that yourself is very empowering. And then for our test stage, um, these are things that can be automated in the CI/CD process. Um, things like Jenkins, Travis CI, Azure Pipelines, at Pantheon, we have products called Autopilot and Build Tools. Um, those can help a lot. I added this in here because people are like, but tell us more about Pantheon stuff. And I was like, okay, if you don't want me to talk about Pantheon, I'll talk to you about Pantheon. I don't want to sell at Pantheon at people. Um, but they are really great tools that take a lot of the manual stresses 
of your testing away. So, so these are things that you definitely want to look into because it will it will ease your workload and like the cognitive switching that happens if you can set it and forget it. And then finally, we've got these stages of development uh, or deployment. Stage of development, deployment, there are different types of deployments. This one was difficult for me to understand initially what was going on. Uh, so there's blue-green deployments. So that technique reduces the amount of downtime and risk that you're gonna have because it will run two identical production environments. And then once you have fully deployed and tested software like in your green environment, then you switch your router so that all of the incoming requests go to the green environment instead of the blue environment. And it's a way that like you have two things that are up and running and you don't take out your one thing that's running and end up with the Drupal for ants and the blank white screen that I was talking about earlier, right? Um, and it switches like which one is live and which one is idle. Uh, that was pretty helpful. Sorry, I'm trying to learn how to scroll down on a Mac. Um, for rolling deployments, so with your rolling deployments, you are slowly replacing previous versions of the application that you had with a new version of the application. Uh, these are all in a deployment environment. Um, it completely replaces the infrastructure where the application is running. Most of what I'm used to working with right now is like kind of blue-green um, or canary. So, and I did not know the name for Canary until someone mentioned it. So Canary uh, deployment strategies release the application and services incrementally to different subsets of users, right? So in the example I had with the retirement fund, we're not sending out, you know, the new version of the pension app to everyone, all 7,000 retirees that are there. It's just slowly by slowly doing it. Um, it... Uh, it is the lowest with risk uh, factors um, compared to all the other strategies because of that kind of control. And for in-place um, in place deployments, uh, it's updating the application version without replacing the infrastructure components. Um, the previous version of the application is stopped and then the latest one is installed the new version of the application started and validated, and then it lets your application deployments proceed with like minimal disturbance to your underlying infrastructure. Because for me, what I've experienced is that the infrastructure crashing is what caused me like the most like freakouts and frustrations there. Did anybody have any questions about any of these parts? Cool. All right, so structuring our projects. This is like a heavy part for front-end developers. For your file setups, do not use your production APIs for your dev and test environments. Um, sometimes your team will want to do that, but especially if you're going with the process that we just talked about, right? You're doing extensive testing when you're sending out requests to your API. Frequently, if it's like a very, if you purchase access to an API, that's going to cost you every single time you run a test, right? This was a thing I did not know, so I hard-coded requests to the API that we were paying for. And then my senior developer at the finance place was like, Hi, Taryn, where are your environment variables? And I was like, what's an environment variable? And like, yeah, <laughs> so I learned about that the hard way. Um, uh, and then I also learned about secrets because we didn't have things like that. They were set up somewhere else. All your secrets are going to be your private keys and your tokens that you have for authentifying um, with your cloud-based services. You don't want to hard code those somewhere where people can have them because it's insecure. I have not done that, so that was great. But um, with your environmental variables, uh, you can actually have your file structure set up. And I apologize, I don't have visualizations for this because it's still a little bit work in progress. Um, but you can have it where you have a test API that you've set up. Uh, you can use a tool like Swagger um, to say, okay, well, here's this little subset of data that we want to access, right? Especially if you don't want to get too much into exploring. It's, it's okay. You don't want to get too much into putting people's PII, personally identifying information, on a server, having all of that information exposed to someone. 
You can set up your test data so that you know what to expect and get back. Um, you can have a totally different route set up for if your application is running or your dev environment or test environment. And when you go to your lab application, um, being able to get uh, the actual information out, do your test on dev and, sorry, do your test on dev and test is a uh, summary of what I wanted to say there. Um, live should be used for like, mission critical things. Um, and then for your CSS, um, this one I think is going to be a conversation between you and your team, right? Because there are different approaches. You can decide if you're going to compile on your local and it, or if you're going to compile on dev or test like your deployment environment. They have pros and cons to each one. Um, you can use Gulp or NPM, but if your team has not agreed which way that you're going to do it, there can be times that, you know, let's say that John is in the room with me right now. Um, John decides that he's going to compile on his local for his branch, the CSS that he's working on, and then I compile on my branch, and then we both send it up to the same dev environment. We're going to have a conflict where your CSS file that ends up coming out is going to be much different. Um, there are uh, CI CD tools that will help you with being able to build that on the environment and know to not um, accept a CSS file that has not been compiled, minified, optimized, or to alert you, hey, there's two discrepancies going on here. Um, and, yeah. Can you configure that in Python? So the question is, can you configure your um, yeah, your yeah. CSS builds in Pantheon? Yeah. I believe that the answer is no. There are tools for it, and we do support integrations with tools. Uh, Circle CI, I'm familiar with. Um, there's another one that I'm blanking on. Uh, you can do some stuff in, like GitHub Actions that's turned oh, before. GitHub but, Actions. Uh, we don't have like NPM on the server to run. Mm -hmm. builds after so, so the GitHub Actions compiles and commits the CSS and JavaScript? Yeah, yes. It would, have, it would have somehow be part of your CI pipeline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we, have and, and we do have some projects like uh, there's a there's a terminus build tools plugin that has starting points for the CI pipeline. So it's not part of the platform, but you know, we do have kind of standard approaches. Mm -hmm. And anytime that you choose whatever kind of uh, hosting or web apps provider, you do want to ask those questions, um, even if you are the front end developer, because it helps you to know is this going to meet our team's needs, right? Great question. Thank you. And then just like a last one for here, this one's kind of near and dear to me, DevOps and accessibility. I'm an accessibility practitioner. That's my particular vertical that I specialize in, in front-end development. Um, you can have, so when you're doing accessibility tests, when you're doing any kind of front-end stuff, right, people will want to see like your comps that you have and be like, okay, well, what does this look like once this is all built out? Um, there is a lot of manual testing that is necessary for accessibility, but there is a lot of stuff that we can automate too, right? And on top of that, there's integrations like, uh, there's one called Pally that I got to work with that I really liked, where it will run scripts once you have compiled and pushed, sorry, once you've compiled your CSS, compiled the rest of your project, and pushed it out to your development or test environment, and it will let you know, well, hey, I see that there are contrast issues on like this particular page, on this line of code, um, and you might want to go in and check it. So it brings in your WC3 uh, WCAG principles, and it will automatically go in and test that. Like there's browser plugins, right? But if you can get a report back, right? Once you've built it, you've got it in your test environment, and to know, oh, I need to go in and fix this, that's one last step for you. That saved me a lot of time. Um, there are also, um, visual regression testing that can be set up. Forgive me, John and Brian, I keep forgetting which Pantheon product does visual regression testing. I'm two months in for the recording in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> it's part of autopilot, yeah. Um, there are other products, uh, Tugboat will do it. I know Tugboat and autopilot because I worked at Pantheon and Lullaby, but there are other tools that will do this. Uh, visual regression testing allows you to see if you made a change in your code, what it changed, 
because there's like us trying to do it with our eyes as humans, right? But we have a bias to not be able to see what has changed. It's just what our brains do. Um, but visual regression testing, different tools will let you see different extenses. What am I trying to say? So sometimes it'll just tell you, oh, well, this changed. But it might be that you changed a word on the page, right? And it just shifts a little bit. Other tools offer more sophistication with that. Um, and um, just many of these workflows can have the automated ally testing, automated accessibility. Um, I, I can provide some more resources for this, but DevOps really helps with being able to do accessibility stuff, especially when an org or a client or somebody might not understand like how important that is. They're like, well, isn't this extra work? Aren't you gonna bill me more for this? It's like, no, this is built as a part of our process. So, so I know I went over a lot of stuff really quick. There's actually like a whole lot more to learn about DevOps. John is my manager, I was sitting with him and I'm like, well, John, I gotta tell him about everything. And he's like, you don't have to tell them about everything. You also don't have to know and master all of this like right now, like y'all are experts now, go out and preach. DevOps or front-end developers, no. You don't have to know it all, because as Hansel says, do I know what I'm doing today? No, but I'm here, I'm gonna give it my best shot. Thanks, y'all.